Well, let me take a moment to welcome all of our campuses as well as those of you who are joining us online. We're very, very excited that you're with us at North Star today as we are continuing in a series that we've been in over these past few weeks together entitled You in Five Years. You in Five Years, where we just simply are looking at the idea of where do you want to be in five years? And so if you haven't been with us over these past couple of weeks, let me sort of bring you up to date really quick and just kind of tell you what we've been talking about. We've been talking about this whole concept and idea that I shared the very first week that we were together, and it's just simply this. Most of us underestimate what we can do in the long term, but we overestimate what we can do in the short term. It's just simply the idea that most of us underestimate what we can do in the long term, and we overestimate what we can do in the short term. And so what I've been challenging us to do is not to look at short-term goals, but to think about long-term. Where do we want to be in five years? Who do you believe God wants you to be five years from now? And what is it going to take for you to get there? Because the reality is, is that you underestimate what, can, um, what you can do in the long term. It's the idea of compound interest. How when you have compound interest over the long haul, you gain momentum and more and more and more begins to happen in your life. And the power of change that can take place in your life is extraordinary. Today, I want to begin with a quote. It's just a simple quote. It's a Chinese proverb that says this, even a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Even a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. It's just simply this idea that if you were to go on a journey to a thousand miles or four thousand miles, basically that journey would begin with one step and you would get there one step at a time. Now, that should cause us to pause because it means something else for us. I mean, we can be heading in the right direction, but if we turn around and we begin to walk in the opposite direction, it can take us one step at a time, a thousand miles in the opposite direction, which means we would be 2,000 miles away from our final destination or the destination that we really wanted to get to. And with that in mind, what I want to do today is to challenge us to think about this five-year journey where we're going to be in 2024 and how we can get there by taking one step at a time. In fact, here's what I'm really saying. Let me just kind of show you this. We get to where we want to be and we get to where we don't want to be the exact same way, the exact same way. How is that? One step at a time. It's just simply one step at a time. And so what I've been trying to challenge you with in this series and what I've been challenging myself with in this series is just simply to say, okay, Marty, if you're going to get to where you want to be five years from now, it's one step at a time. And you've got to begin to think about how or, or, or where it is you want to be and to know that it's one step at a time. It's one day at a time. It's one minute at a time. It's one week at a time. And over time, what begins to happen is if you're consistent, there's this compound interest that begins to take place in your life. And what begins to take place is, is you all of a sudden have momentum in your life to push you forward to where you really want to be. And so today, what I want to do for a few moments is I want to talk to you about something that I think is crucial and vitally important for all of us if we're really going to get to that final destination, and not really a final destination, but to the destination that we want to be in five years. Where is it that you want to be? Where do you want to be in your marriage? Where do you want to be in your relationships? Where do you want to be financially? Where do you want to be physically? You're thinking about these different areas of your life, not just over the next year, but by 2024, where do you want to be? And so today, there's one thought that I want to talk about over this entire message, and I really want to challenge you with it. And so if you're at one of our campuses, uh, if you're here in the auditorium with me today, or if you're joining us online, let me encourage you to go ahead and take out your notes. That way you can write things down that I'm going to say. We give those to you to help you, uh, to disciple you, to help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus. And so I want you to take that out just for a moment. Here's where we're going to begin today. It's our bottom line. It's the one thought that I'm going to talk about. Victor Victory is a small thing continually repeated. Victory is a small thing continually repeated. If you're going to have victory in your life, if you're going to be successful at getting to where you want to get over the next five years, then what you're going to have to do is you are going to have to continually repeat something that is small in your life. 
Because victory is a small thing continually repeated. Let me just give you an example to kind of help you think about this. Uh, victory is a small thing continually repeated in your marriage. Date night is a small thing that is continually repeated that gives you great results in your relationship and in your marriage. It builds incredible intimacy in your relationship. It's a small thing, continually repeated, that gives you incredible results. If you're trying to get out of debt, you may be thinking to yourself, I mean, good grief, I'm in debt and I'm making this small payment, uh, this little extra payment every month of interest. I mean, what in the world is it going to do for me? Well, guess what? Victory is a small thing, continually repeated. Over time, it pays off one of your bills so that you can pay off another bill. And as you continue to do this small thing over and over again, eventually you are debt-free in your life. And that's what begins to happen. So when you begin to think about this idea of a small thing continually repeated, for maybe someone that's here today that is an addict, let me just say this to you. Maybe in your life, it's that one meeting a week. It's going to celebrate recovery or that small group or it's being at an AA meeting. That one small step every week continually repeated begins to give you success and allows you to continue to be sober in your life. And so what I want to do today is I want us to look in the Old Testament at a passage of Scripture that I believe is really, really powerful. And what we're going to do to give you a little bit of background is we're going to look at the nation that God had chosen, the people of Israel. And they are getting ready to to leave Egypt. Now, if you're not familiar with the story, uh, they had been taken into slavery. They had been there over 400 years. Moses has been raised up as a leader. He's getting ready to lead them towards the promised land. On that journey for 40 years, they wandered. And what we're going to do is we're going to look here at a passage of Scripture that specifically talks about when they're getting ready to go into the land that God had promised them. And this passage of Scripture is powerful because what it does is it says something to us in the same way that it said something to them. It tells us that Israel is getting ready to enter into this land that God has promised them. And what we're going to see is we're going to see that this is kind of like a pep talk. It's sort of God saying to them, hey, here's some things I want you to remember. Here's some things you're going to have to do if you're going to get to where I want you to be. If you're going to proclaim this land that I have promised to you. And you know, isn't it true? Because I think it's true in your life and it's true in my life. It's not going to be easy for you to become who God wants you to be. And it's not going to be easy for you to get to where you want to get over these next five years. It's easier for us to stay the same way. It's easier for us to be exactly who we were when we started, right? We talked about that last week. You see, it's easier for you, it's easier for you to stay with your problem. It's easier for you to stay with your temper. It's easier for you to stay with those unhealthy habits that you have in your life. It's easier for you to be lazy. It's easier for you to stay in, uh, as a person who is argumentative. It's easier for you to stay cantankerous. It's easier for you to continue to gossip or to continue to be a, a critical person with a critical spirit. It's easy to not do anything but want everything. It's easy to feel like you're entitled to something that you're really not entitled to. And what God was doing in this passage of Scripture that we're going to look at is he was giving a warning to the Israelites not to feel entitled, but to understand that they were going to have to do some things in order to be able to conquer this land that God had promised them that he was going to fulfill uh, in their very lives. And so I want you to look with me in Deuteronomy chapter 7, and then we're going to look in um, in Exodus chapter 23, and here's why. Because both of these are the exact same story, but in Exodus 23, we're given a little bit of a different detail, and I want us to look at that because I think it's very powerful, and it's going to help us as we look at this together. And so here, I want you to look with me at this passage of Scripture, beginning in verse 17. It says, perhaps you will think to yourselves, how can we ever conquer these nations that are so much more powerful than we are? So he said, all right, the nations that you're going to come up against are very powerful nations. And because you, Israel, are so small, you're going to think to yourself, how in the world can we overcome these nations? Now, I want you to think about that in your own life personally, just for a moment. 
Isn't it true that for you to overcome some of the things in your life that you want to overcome, it almost seems like what? It almost seems like it's impossible for you to conquer because that addiction that you have is more powerful than your, 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 your own will. Or that, that problem that you're having in your marriage seems so much bigger uh, than uh, something simple that you could do that would make a change and help you to have a, a better relationship. Or that debt, it seems insurmountable and you don't think you're ever going to be able to conquer it. And that's exactly what he was saying here to Israel. He said, these nations are large and they are big and they are strong. And you're going to think to yourself, how can we ever conquer these powerful nations? And I bet many of you right now in your life, that's exactly how you feel about the next five years. You're thinking, how in the world am I ever going to conquer this? Don't lose sight and don't lose hope. I've got great news for you today. Let's continue. Listen to what it says. But do not be afraid of them. Just remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all the land of Egypt. So here's what God's saying to him. He's saying, remember back to what I've done for you before. As you go into the land, listen, it's going to be easy for you to forget, but I want you to remember that I have always been with you. That not only was I with you in Egypt, and not only did I help you to overcome Pharaoh, and I hardened his heart, and I changed him, and he allowed you guys to leave. He says, don't forget that I was with you. Don't forget what I've done in your life. And listen, guys, I think that's important for every one of us to remember that if God is for us, then who in the world can be against us? And then he goes on in verse, 19, or verse 22. It says, the Lord your God will drive those nations out ahead of you little by little. And there's the key word. I don't want you to miss this. In fact, I want us to do something right now. At all of our campuses, for those of you that are online and at home, uh, you can say it out loud with us. But I want us to say these three little words together. Little by little, all right? One, two, three. Little by little. There you go. Little by little, God said. He didn't say big, huge steps. He didn't say over one night it was going to happen. He said little by little. You will not clear them away all at once. Otherwise, the wild animals would multiply too quickly for you. Then in verse 23, notice what he says. But the Lord your God will hand them over to you. He will throw them into complete confusion until they are destroyed. How is he going to do it? Little by little. One step at a time. Now, let's run over to Exodus, and I want us to look in Exodus 23. It says, but I will not drive them out in a single year. Notice there he gets very specific. He says, it's not going to happen in a year. Do you remember what I said at the beginning of the series? I said, great things don't happen in just one year. It takes three to five years for great things, for great changes to come and to really root themselves in our lives and for us to really begin to become the person that we want to become, that we think God wants us to be. So notice, but I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals would multiply and threaten you. Here's what God's saying. What he's saying to the Israelites is, is what you, what you obtain, you have to be able to maintain. What you obtain, you have to be able to maintain. He's saying, listen, I'm not going to give you all of this land at one time because if I did, you couldn't maintain it because you're too small. He said, so over time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you what you didn't work for. They're going to live in houses they didn't build. They're going to drink from wells they didn't dig. They're going to eat from gardens they never planted. But God said, this is not going to happen all at once because if it did, the land would become desolate, the wild animals would multiply, and then guess what? When you got ready to move into some of the places that God's going to give you, there'd be wild animals living there because guess what? You, you, you obtained it, but you couldn't maintain it. And then notice this, it goes on in verse 30. I will drive them out a little at a time until your population has increased enough to take the possession of the land. It was the idea of compound interest like we've been talking. God said, you're going to continue to grow. You're going to continue to grow in population. And as you do, I'm going to continue to multiply you. And I'm going to continue to bless you in your life. You see, it's important for you and I to understand that victory is a small thing continually repeated. It's a small thing continually repeated. You see, if we're ever going to get there, 
I mean, if you're ever going to speak that new language, if you're ever going to have better health, if you're ever going to live debt-free, if you're ever going to do something or to have something that you'll be able to retire on, if you're ever going to overcome that addiction, whatever the goal is, whatever the aim is for you, you've got to understand the steps that are going to get us to a thousand miles need to be small enough that we will actually be able to do them and that we can sustain them over the long haul. You see, I really believe this with all of my heart. I believe the reason that so many of us never obtain the goals that we set and the reason that so many of us are never able to get to the place that we want to get to over the next five years is because we set goals that oftentimes we can't maintain. We set goals that over the long haul we lose heart and we begin to say, you know what, I will never be able to do that. And, and we just lose faith and we lose confidence in our ability to be able to attain those goals. You see, most of us, it's not that we're not dreaming or that we're dreaming too much. It's not that we're planning too much. It's not that we're hoping too much. It's not that we're even inspiring too much. For most of us, we make them so big that there's no way that we can possibly do them and keep them up for an entire year. And so what happens is, is we throw in the towel and we quit. And we just say, I would never be able to do this. I want to remind you of what God told Israel. He said, little by little. Little by little, victory is, in, is a small thing continually repeated. That's what God was saying to them. And he said, it's that small thing continually repeated that is ultimately going to give you victory in your life. And that's the, that was true for them, and it is true for you and I today. So here's the solution. Now, some of you are going to miss this, and I don't want you to miss it, but I want you to just pay attention for the next few moments, and then I'm going to give you some practical application. If you want to get to where you want to be in the next five years, I really believe this with all of my heart. The solution is, is that you should make goals that are stupidly small. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, Marty, why did you use the word stupid? Well, because really and truly, they should be stupidly small. In fact, I was reading this book, and there was this guy, and he, he was saying this. He said that one of the things that he realized one day when he was getting ready to work out is he was sitting on the couch and he was trying to muster up the energy to say, all right, I'm going to get up, I'm going to put on my clothes, I'm going to go to the gym. Now, I know some of you have been there, right? You, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're sitting on the couch, you're trying to muster up the energy, you're telling yourself, you know what, I'm going to get up, I'm going to put on my clothes, and I'm going to go to the gym. And that's a hard thing to do in that moment. And he said he began to think about something. He thought to himself, you know what? Instead of me trying to muster up the energy to put on my clothes, to get in the car, and to drive to the gym, what if I just did one push-up? What if I just made this stupid goal of just doing one push-up? Now, I know what you're thinking. One push-up. I mean, what is that going to do? Well, here's the reality. If you do one push-up, guess what? Something's going to happen. You're going to be motivated because it was something that you could do. And you know what? You'll come back and you'll say, man, you know what? I was able to do one push-up, so now I'm going to do two push-ups. And then eventually it'll be three push-ups. And over time it'll be four. And over time, all of a sudden you're doing 100 push-ups. You see, you've got to set your goal small enough that you can continue to be consistent. That you can continue to say, hey, you know what? Victory is a small thing continually repeated. I, I mean, if I do one push-up for an entire month, and you may think that's crazy, I do one push-up for an entire month, and then all of a sudden I begin to do two, and then I'm doing three, and then I'm doing four. Over time, what begins to happen is, is I'm getting stronger and stronger, and my endurance level goes up, and I find myself able to do much more than I ever thought that I would be able to do. So I want to challenge you over these next uh, couple of months, as you're thinking about your five-year goals, set your goals small enough that you are able to continue to repeat them over and over and over again. All right. A couple of pointers as we begin to put this into practice in our lives. What God is speaking to us when he tells us little by little, in fact, I want us to say that out loud again on three at all of our campuses, one, two, three, little by little. What is God saying to us? He's saying victory is a small thing continually repeated in each and every one of our lives. And you see, when you say that phrase, let me just tell you this. You can read it straight from the mouth of Jesus. 
In fact, Jesus said this. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like what? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and he sowed in his field. And then listen to what the next verse says. The next verse says, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air can come and nest in its branches. Something little, something stupidly small, like a mustard seed, something too small to fail, and all of a sudden it becomes something that is so great. Something that is so great. Why do so many people not get there? It's because simply in our lives, we do exactly what Zechariah says not to do. And we despise the days of the small things. Guys, I am telling you, I know this series is different than anything that you've ever heard. Because oftentimes in your life, you're being told, set goals for the next year. Make them big and audacious. But the reality is, if they're small enough for you to be consistent in, over time, victory is a small thing continually repeated. And therein lies the problem for most of us. It's not small enough that we can continue to repeat it day after day. And so it's important. We don't despise the small things. We keep being persistent, and we keep persisting, and we keep persisting, and we keep persisting, little by little, little by little, little by little, city by city, day by day, month by month, and over time, guess what? Great things begin to happen, and something great comes out of our lives. But isn't it true that we get discouraged? We get discouraged because we want instant progress. We want instantly to see what we've made a difference. And that's just not how it works. But if we trust the process, and if we believe that it starts little, look at this. We start little, and what will happen is, is we can end up with much. And that's what I want for each and every one of you. Now, let me just take a moment to give you four things that I think are important if you really are going to be able to do it little by little. The four things that I want you to write down are this. The first one is this. Choose carefully. Choose carefully. Now, what do I mean by that? Very quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Why? Because not all goals are created equally. What do I mean by that? you got to choose your goals carefully uh, because not all goals are created equally. Some have the greater ability to transform your life than others. In fact, researchers, I've done a ton of research on this. You can look it up on Google if you don't believe me. But researchers say this. Researchers refer to this as keystone habits. There are certain keystone habits that if you, if you establish them in your life, then what they do is through compound interest, they begin to push other habits forward in your life. In fact, this week as I was studying, I looked at a magazine called Business Week magazine. And there was a particular article on this idea of keystone habits. And I want you just to listen to what this guy says. He just, now he listed way more than this, but he just listed a few keystone habits. He said, getting up every day and making your bed, just making your bed is correlated with increased productivity. That is, if you want to be more productive in your life, did you know that getting up every day and making your bed would actually make you more productive throughout the day? That one keystone habit of establishing in your life. In fact, there's a guy by the name of, uh, I call him JP. Uh, His name is, um, I actually just went blank. I, I can't even remember. Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson says this to young millennials. He says, if you would get up every day and make your bed, you'd be shocked at the difference it'd begin to make in your life. He's talking about a keystone habit, establishing a keystone habit in your life. The second habit he talked about was this, eating dinner together as a family. In fact, the writer of the article, a guy by the name of Duhigg, said this, families who habitually eat dinner together seem to raise children with better homework skills, higher grades, greater emotional control, and more confidence. Absolutely crazy. But you know why? It's because they've established that keystone habit of eating dinner together. Uh, Exercising regularly, he said this, exercise triggers people to start eating better. Maybe you set a goal to say, I'm going to eat better. Can I tell you what keystone habit would actually make that happen in your life? The reality that if you would get up every day and just exercise. I didn't say run five miles. I didn't say go to the gym for 30 minutes. I just said get up every day and exercise. Start small. What, what does that mean for you? Maybe it's a push-up. 
Uh, maybe you can go outside and walk to the mailbox, and then eventually you walk a little bit further, or maybe you begin to walk further. I don't know. But if you do that, that keystone habit does what? It eventually leads to the place that you begin to make better eating choices. You find yourself with increased patience, less stress, and more productivity at work. The second thing I want you to write down is this. Spell it out specifically. Spell it out specifically. Now, what do I mean by that? Whatever your one thing is that you're going to be doing in the coming days, spell it out specifically. Make it concrete and make a concrete plan to be able to accomplish it. You see, for many of us, we don't get specific enough. In fact, I got to tell you this. Uh, I, I think that many of us, we're, we're not specific with the details like attorneys are when they write a contract. I mean, it's important to understand that if you're going to be able to, to make it over the long haul, you've got to get to the place that there are no fuzzy lines. Now, when I use the term fuzzy lines, what am I saying? You've got to be real clear. So as to spell out, hey, here is what my next step is going to be. Each day, this is where I'm going, or this is what I'm going to do if I'm going to get to where God wants me to be. So let me just give you a couple of examples real quickly. If you, you might say, uh, what, what, what would be fuzzy lines? This would be fuzzy to me. Um, I'm going to eat better, okay? That's vague. I'm going to eat better. What does that mean? How are you going to eat better? I mean, you're going to eat better, but how will you ever know if you get there? Like, what are you going to change? Uh, what are you going to throw out? And specifically, what are the things you're going to do in order that you can be able to eat better? Um, I think this one would be fuzzy. Maybe you say to yourself, you know what? Uh, I am going to, um, I'm not going to text while I'm driving. Okay, that's a great goal. In fact, I, I would say to you, I even want to accomplish that in my life. But it's fuzzy. Why is that, all right? Specifically, let me tell you why. Because if you're not careful, you can what? You can email, you can Instagram, you can Twitter, you can Facebook. There's all kinds of things that you can still do on your phone. So maybe not to be fuzzy, you would say something like this. Be specific. I'm, going, I'm not going to pick up my phone or look at my phone while I am driving. Notice that is far more specific. It's not fuzzy at all. Here's what another one that I think would be fuzzy. Somebody would say, I'm going to drink less, okay? Less of what? Less of Coke? Less of alcohol? Like, what, what do you mean you're going to drink less? I mean, because let's just be honest for a second. Less alcohol, less what? Less, less than who? Because maybe your friend drinks 10 beers. Are you going to drink less than your friend? And, and let me just remind you of something. Someone is always drunker than you are. You've got to be specific and you have to spell it out because so many times it's fuzzy for us. Number three, the third thing I would say if you're going to accomplish this, track it diligently, track it diligently. What I mean there, this sounds crazy, all right, but just very quickly, what I mean there is simply this. You've got to write it down. You've got to say, all right, I'm going to choose carefully and I'm going to, specific, and I'm going to be specific, but I'm going to spell it out. I'm going to track it. I mean, it's the idea that you've got to keep score. Now, I know for some of you, you think, well, I don't want to keep score. Well, you've got to keep score. You've got to have data, and you've got to write things down. Why? Because if you don't, you will, you, you'll either give up or you'll become discouraged. You've got to write down what you're eating. You've got to write down how often you have your quiet time. You've got to write down how often you're going on your date. Why is that? Because when you see the specifics, it begins to make a difference in your life. Let me just give you a quick example. I mean, could you imagine going bowling and they put a big curtain up and you can't see the pins? But what you can do is you can take the bowling ball and you can toss it. And when you toss it, I want you to think about this just for a moment. You hit the pins, but you never know how many you, 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 you uh, knock down. What would that do for you? Like, like over time, you would just get non-interested. You'd say, I don't want to do this because it's just not fun. I mean, it'd be like going to a ball game and they don't keep score, and, and eventually you would just become uninterested. You'd say, I just don't want to do this anymore. You see this one change, if you write it down, if you write down when you work out, if you write down when you have a quiet time, if you write down when you read your Bible, it actually causes you to begin to keep score in your mind. And what that does is it creates a competitiveness on the inside of you. And it's absolutely life-changing to keep track of the small incremental steps because they begin to add up in life and it's exactly what you want. Victory is a small thing continually repeated. And that means that you've got to track it diligently. Look at number four with me. Guard it aggressively. Guard it aggressively. What do I mean by that? All right, very simply, here's what I'm saying. 
You've got to guard your goals aggressively. You've got to guard what you're going to do aggressively. Here's what, here's what, I'm, what, here's, here's what, what I mean when I say that. I mean, there is going to be a day where you don't get up and do what you're supposed to do. And if you're not careful, here's what you're going to do. You're going to throw in the towel. You're going to say, you know what? I'll just do that next year. I wasn't able to accomplish it this year. Therefore, I'm just going to throw in the towel. No, that's not what you want to do. You want to guard it aggressively. What I mean by that is this. You're, the idea in this entire series is about consistency. It's about the idea that if you repeatedly do the same thing over and over and over again, what happens is, is all of a sudden there's compound interest. It begins to what? It, it's like compound interest. It begins to compound, and there is momentum, and over time, it pushes you forward. So here's the goal. Here's what I'm saying. If you are going to get to the place that you guard it aggressively, when you get up one morning and you don't do what you're supposed to do, just say, okay, it's okay. Maybe I slept in the day. Maybe I was sick and I wasn't feeling good. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to aggressively tell myself, how consistent can I be and how long can I go before I miss another time? Before I miss another time, whatever it is. If it's working out, you say, how long can I go just to be consistent? How long can I go for date night to be consistent? How long can I go to be consistent to that meeting that I know that I should be going to? How long can I go paying that extra interest so that I can get out of debt? You just continually tell yourself that you're going to remain consistent. In fact, let me just tell you how staggering this is. I think every one of you at all of our campuses today, those of you that are here in the auditorium, and for those of you online, if you want to grab a piece of paper, you can. But I just want to illustrate this idea of, of just telling yourself, hey, I'm going to guard it aggressively, this idea of compounding, all right? I want you to take a piece of paper, and I want you to do this. You can take your message notes, all right? And I want you to fold it in half, all right? So one plus one equals two, all right? So we went from one, and now we have two. Now, I want you to fold it again. Two plus two equals four. And if you fold it again, notice this. Four plus four equals eight. Eight plus eight equals 16. All right, I think I can go one more. And then 16 plus 16 equals 32. Now, I want you to notice, you probably can't tell this greatly, but let me just say this. I want you to notice the thickness of the paper that's in your hand. Don't miss this, all right, because this is so important. Did you know that if you could do this and you could get to where you had folded it 10 times, it would be the thickness of your hand? If you continued and you were able to get to the place that you were to get to 30, 30 would reach what we would call the limits of space, 100 kilometers, 100 kilometers. That's how thick the paper would be. If you could get to 42, you'd be to the moon. 51, you would be to the sun. And then notice this. If you continued to add and you were able to get to 103 folds, to 103 folds, you would be at the distance of 93 billion light years. Think about that just for the second. That is the expanse of the observable universe. That is the power of compounding. That is the power of, of, of the small thing continually repeated in your life. Victory is a small thing continually repeated over time. Make your goal small, small enough that you can continue to repeat them and watch where you are in five years. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words that you gave to the Israelites as they got ready to go into the promised land. And God, what you said to them is what you're saying to us today, little by little. Victory is accomplished in our life when we do the small thing continually repeated. And Father, I pray over your congregation today and those that are listening that they would do that one small thing over and over and over and over again and watch the victory that would come in their life. Father, I pray that you would help us to know it's little by little. It's day by day. It's one step at a time in the right direction. And over time, that begins to compound. And God, it brings momentum. And that momentum launches us forward in ways we never thought that we could be launched. There's some listening to my voice today that their marriage is going to be stronger because 
They're going to establish a date night over these next five years. There's some God that are going to be out of debt because they're going to take financial peace and they're going to commit for the next uh, few months to really begin to make the right choices one small step at a time. And God, five years, 10 years from now, they're going to find themselves out of debt. There's some that have decided they're going to be physically healthy and they're going to begin to make some changes in their life and they're going to get specific and they're going to write it down. And God, five years from now, they're going to be 60 pounds lighter and they're going to have a six pack. I mean, it's going to be amazing what begins to happen in their life because they begin to work so diligently and so hard. And so I pray, God, that you would help each one of us to begin to do it little by little, one step at a time. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, some of you are listening to me today, and I want to just say this. It's little by little, and it's one step at a time. And you're wanting to make changes in your life, and you know that right now your life has been turned upside down. You've made some bad choices. You've done some things that in your life you know are a result of of some of the decisions that you've made. And you've been trying to figure out, how am I going to make these changes? Well, I want you to know today the only way you're ever going to be able to make those changes is when you begin a personal, intimate relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And if you've never done that, I want to give you an opportunity today to do that because it's the only thing that is going to give you the power to be able to change. Little by little, one step at a time, you need to take this step today. You say, Pastor Marty, what do I have to do? Here's what the Bible says. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. God loves you. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And he wants you to be able to accomplish that purpose. But the only way that can happen is through a relationship with him. And that can begin right now in this moment. All you have to do is pray a prayer, something like this, in your heart and just mean it. Just say these words to God. Dear God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Please come into my heart and be the Lord and the Savior of my life. God, I take this step of faith today in believing in who you are and who your son is. Believing that God, through the power of the resurrection of Jesus, not only do I have eternity with you in heaven, but my life can be changed right now today. Thank you, God, for loving me, and thank you, Jesus, for saving me. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you just prayed that prayer, the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. And I want to encourage you. I want to just tell you this. The Bible says that right now the angels in heaven are rejoicing, and we as a church rejoice with you and over you right now in this moment. And what I want to do is pray for you, but I also want you to know this. I want you to know that this is the greatest day of your life. And if you just prayed that prayer with me across all of our campuses, I'm going to ask you to do something really brave. But with heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, if you just prayed that prayer, I want to pray for you as your pastor. I want to ask you if you would just to raise your hand. There you go. Hold it up there just for a second. God bless you. We see your hand. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. For those of you that are online, right below me, you see the hand. You can click on that, and we'll be sure that we record your decision, and I want to pray for you. Father, I pray for every hand that's gone up on every campus today. For those online, maybe for the first time, who are putting their faith and their trust in Jesus. God, we rejoice with the angels in heaven. We ask now that, God, you would help us to be able to help them to grow in their relationship with Jesus. We rejoice in their newfound faith. And God, we thank you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, if that was you, I just want to encourage you, man. So excited about your decision. Your campus pastor is going to be coming here in just a minute. And they'll be telling you a little bit more about what you can do to begin to grow in your relationship with Christ. And how also you can let us know about that decision so that we could send you some information in the mail uh, this week so that you can begin to grow in your relationship with Jesus. Hey, I want you to remember one thing today when you leave. And it's the bottom line. It's the one thought that we talked about this week. Victory is a small thing continually repeated. And so as your campus pastor comes today, I want us to put our hands together and celebrate all those who have committed their life to Christ.